Today on America's Test Kitchen, Dan makes Bridget sauteed tilapia with chive lemon miso butter. Adam reveals his top pick for food processors. Jack shares his knowledge of Italian pastas. And Becky makes Julia pesce all'acqua pazza. It's all coming up right here on America's Test Kitchen. Tilapia is the third most consumed fish in the United States. That's after tuna and salmon. And it's easy to see why, because tilapia is tasty, it's nutritious, and it's sustainable. So Dan's here, and he's going to show us a great way that we can make tilapia at home. So cooking fish is one of my favorite things to do in the entire world. And then there are certain fish that are great for poaching, others for grilling, others for searing. And tilapia is wonderful seared. It browns up beautifully in the skillet. So that's what we're gonna do today. Before we get there, we're gonna do a quick salting on this. So um, I have a teaspoon of kosher salt here, and I'm just gonna hit it on both sides. I have four six ounce tilapia fillets. And this is a really awesome treatment for fish. You know, we talk about brining and salting lean proteins. And with fish, because they're so thin, it happens really quickly, which is really nice. Um, and you can brine or salt. I'm gonna do salting today. I really like it. it. Doesn't introduce any water, and we're gonna be searing, so that's a nice benefit of it. Plus, it helps keep the flavor nice and concentrated. Absolutely, yeah. yep. We're gonna let the fish sit for 15 minutes, so we're gonna get better seasoning and better moisture retention. Great, just 15 minutes. Just Fantastic. 15 minutes. So while that's happening, I'm gonna to put together a little finishing butter. Mm. So I'm starting with two tablespoons of white miso. So it's a really sweet, mild miso with tons of umami. And to that, I'm adding a teaspoon of grated lemon zest, two teaspoons of lemon juice, and an eighth of a teaspoon of black pepper. And we're just gonna stir this around. Great. That is well mixed. Next, I have four tablespoons of softened butter here. So we're making a compound butter, which is just a fabulous thing. So it's a really well-flavored butter. That's gonna hit the fish at the end and melt and just be fabulous. So we're gonna mix that in. Okay, and my final addition is two tablespoons of minced chives. Little oniony profile going in there. Exactly. Okay, perfect. Our compound butter is all set. Okay. We need a few more minutes on this and then uh, be ready to cook. Fabulous. So it's been 15 minutes and you can see that there's a little bit of moisture on the surface there. So it's pulled some moisture out. Some of it's gone back in. Whatever is on the surface, I want to pat off so we get a really nice sear. Gotcha. As the moisture was pulled back in, it pulled some of the salt as well. Yep. And I'll get the other side as well. So there's not a lot of tricks to cooking this fish, but one is really, really key, and that is splitting it down the middle. So a lot of fillets that we work with, are, you know, from cod and bigger fish, it's just one nice piece. This is the whole side of a tilapia, because they're not very big fish. So we've got the belly portion, and right. then we have the kind of the back portion. And they're, they're different thicknesses, as you can see. So it's a super simple technique, literally just run it right down and split it into two. So you have thick and thin. Fabulous. And this allows us to cook the thick at one time together mm -hmm. and then the thin, so we're, everybody's happy. So I've got two tablespoons of oil here in a carbon steel skillet. I love cooking in carbon steel. Once it gets seasoned, it's, it's like a nonstick pan. Right. But they're, you, know, you can get them to really high temperatures without any safety issues. Um, and I don't know, they just get better with time, which I think is such a wonderful thing. So you we'll could get, use a nonstick skillet though, if you, that's what you had. Yes, you absolutely could. As long as you have the oil in there um, and you get the fish in right afterwards, you, you'd be in good shape. Okay. Okay, so we're heating over high heat until we just see some little bit of smoke coming and I can see it right now. So I'm gonna go in with the thicker portions first and I'm gonna go on the skin side. That's kind of the nice presentation side. The thin side up, really. Yep. So I'm gonna cook this for about two to three minutes on this side until we have gorgeous, gorgeous browning and then we'll flip and we'll do the same on the other. Okay. So I'm gonna use a thin fish spatula, which is what it's designed for here. <laughs> Literally um, in the name. Yeah, so I'm gonna flip them all over. This is what I meant when I said that it's a great fish for searing. It just takes on incredible mm. color. All done. Gorgeous. Okay, so we're gonna go for another two or three minutes and I'm gonna temp these thicker portions. We're looking for about 130 to 135 degrees. Okay. Okay, so it's been two minutes and I'm gonna check in the thickest part of this filet here and see where we are. Again, we're looking for about 130 to 135 and that looks, yep, 131. Fantastic. Pretty good. All right, so I've got my platter right here, right where I need it, and I'm just gonna transfer these out. My skillet is smoking hot again, so I'm gonna go in with the thin belly portions. 
Same thing, presentation side down. Exactly, yep. All right. So we're not gonna be able to tempt these. We're only gonna cook for about one minute on each side until we get great browning. The good thing is the belly has a lot more fat in it, so it's a lot more forgiving to overcooking. Okay, so I'm gonna go in and flip these. It's been about a minute. Nice color. Nice browning on that. Mm-hmm. Okay, great, so just one more minute on this side. We'll get some nice browning, and we'll get them right up to our platter. Fabulous. These are perfect. I'm gonna shut off the heat there, and we'll just transfer them over to our platter. And they're so thin, you don't need to take the temperature. We know that they're done by this time. Exactly, yep. Mm -hmm. This is my kind of fast food. Right? Yeah. So we've got our gorgeous fish over here. While it's still nice and piping hot, I'm gonna spoon a little bit of the compound butter onto each of our fillets. Mm. That way it melts right into it. Yes, please. Ooh, that looks okay. Melting instantly. Yummy. Doesn't this look elegant and just really, really beautiful? That looks gorgeous. Would you like uh, some of the thicker portion or the belly? Yes. Yes, a little bit of both. I like that. This is looks so good. We gotta get into this. And we have some lemon wedges too if you want. Would you like a little bit of lemon too? Sure, what do you think? Yes. All right, let's dig in. Lovely crust on that. Mm. You really just don't even expect that. Mm. And then in the center of this thicker filet, which I chose because I had a big glob of that miso <laughs> butter on it. Mm. Mm. Fish is really moist. It's well seasoned too. Mm -hmm. And I love that butter. Getting that little piece of crispy belly there. Oh yeah. Yeah, this belly portion is so nice, it's so rich. It's such a mild, clean tasting fish. Mm -hmm. You know, so it takes well to so many different things. It's wonderful with the miso, but you could dress this up in so many different ways. Mm. Yeah, nothing better than fish. It's so good. So fast, so delightful, just like you. Oh, stop it. Thanks, Dan. <laughs> You're welcome. Well, if you wanna make this great dish at home, salt the tilapia and let it sit for 15 minutes. Cook the thinner and thicker pieces separately and finish the dish with a tasty miso lemon butter. So from America's Test Kitchen, moist, delicious, and super fast, sauteed tilapia with chive lemon miso butter. Mm -mm -mm. Food processors are a workhorse in the kitchen and every cook should have one. The question is, which brand is best? You know, in fact, best food processor is one of the most often searched terms on our website. You really do want to buy the right one because mm -hmm. the wrong one is frustrating mm -hmm. and the right one is a miracle machine. Oh, the right one makes everything okay. And I've owned the wrong and the right one and I totally agree. <laughs> we are on the same page. <laughs> What we like from the last test is this guy from Cuisinart, but there are new models on the market. We wanted to see if any of them surpass the old Cuisinart. We bought a fresh copy of the Cuisinart and six others, so our lineup is seven machines, mm -hmm. and we paid a range of $35 to Ooh. $350 for this. Ooh, that's a big range. There's a lot that a food processor does, and testers tried everything. They did dozens of tests, assessed them in a million different ways. We'll go through some of the highlights here. Chopping and grinding. Got to be one of the top priority food processor jobs. Those tests were mincing parsley, making mirepoix out of celery, onions, and carrots, and chopping cold chunks of beef with butter to make hamburger meat. Mm -hmm. And testers were looking for nice uniform pieces of food. Not all of the processors delivered that. The ones that did had a couple of things going for them. Number one, they had a responsive pulse feature. When you took your finger off the pulse button, the blade stopped turning. The ones that kept turning for another couple of seconds overprocessed the food. Interesting. Number two, they had tight tolerances between the end of the blade and the side of the work mm -hmm. bowl. Those tolerances ranged from 
2.9 millimeters to 6.1 millimeters. 6.1 millimeters. Yeah. That's a big gap. It is. And the tighter it is against the side of the bowl, the more engagement the blade and the food have and the more efficient and neat the chopping is. There was also some correlation to how snug the blade was on the bottom of the bowl. Mm -hmm. Blending and mixing are really important tasks, and there were a couple of tests there. The first one is to put a cup of plain yogurt in the work bowl, a single drop of blue and yellow food coloring on either side of the blade and run it for 30 seconds. A lot of the machines left stripes of blue and yellow. The better ones blended the yogurt to a uniform perfect green, which indicated efficient blending. Interesting. Testers also made mayonnaise because that's a more real world thing than green yogurt is. Our recipe uses two yolks and three quarters cup of oil and makes three quarters cup of mayonnaise. Some of them didn't make the mayonnaise very well. And one of them, to our dismay, was our old favorite Cuisinart mm -hmm. that had done a beautiful job in past tests. It turns out that Cuisinart redesigned the blade a little bit so it sits a little higher on the stem, 3.2 millimeters higher. That meant the blade passed over the egg yolks. Testers also tried slicing tomatoes and potatoes with this. You want nice, neat, even slices, and a lot of the success there had to do with the design of the feed tube because the food has got to stand up straight and even as it hits mm -hmm. the blade. So testers like feed tubes that had more different options for fitting things in and just kept them nice and straight. That makes sense. One of the last important tests was to make a double batch of pisaladier dough. Ooh, I love that recipe. That's such a good recipe and I know who developed it. Um, it's that French rustic pizza with the caramelized onions and the anchovies and the olives. The dough is really wet and sticky. The machine that had difficulty with this test is this one right here. This has the nine cup capacity, so it couldn't quite handle the double batch of dough. Also, the motor stalled out a couple Ooh. of times, so we had questions about how durable it would be in the long term. You know, in the end, our old favorite from Cuisinart hmm. won again. It's uh, the Cuisinart Custom 14 cup food processor. We got ours for about $150. It did everything well except the mayonnaise. Uh -huh. Now, you and I both like making mayonnaise. Mm -hmm. I like having a mini bowl. If that's mm -hmm. important to you, you may want to consider the Breville. This is the Breville Sous Chef 12 Plus food processor. We got ours for about $330. Ooh. It's more expensive. It performed almost on par with the Cuisinart. Mm -hmm. and it's got that mini bowl. I see. And there you have it. Our new winner is our old winner. It's the Cuisinart 14 cup food processor that cost us about $150. My Italian grandmother instilled the love of pasta in me, and that includes being a smart shopper. So let's start by figuring out how to read a label. So I've got to check out, this is our winning brand of spaghetti, and on the front here, it has a lot of interesting words. Some of them are more important than others. Let's start at the top, slow dried. Doesn't hurt, but it doesn't help. At least we couldn't tell the difference. It's supposed to improve the texture, but the research we did and the taste tests didn't bear that out. The next thing on the label, coarse ground semolina, that's really important. So durum wheat is used to make pastas. Coarse semolina, which is basically a coarse form of durum, gives it a better bite. It's more likely to cook up al dente and chewy. If you just see durum wheat flour, that means they cut some corners and save some money and you're gonna not like the pasta as much. So semolina's key. Now the cold mountain spring water, that certainly can't hurt, but probably the water you're cooking the pasta in is gonna have a bigger impact than the water that's used in the pasta making. Last but not least, bronze dyes. So pasta is extruded, and most manufacturers wanna save money, so they're using Teflon coated dyes that produce really smooth noodles. Old fashioned machines have bronze dyes that give the pasta a rough pockmarked texture that the sauce grabs onto, and you want the sauce to grab onto your pasta. Now cooking, I know there's a lot of stuff out there. I'm gonna just say two things I want you to remember. You're probably not using enough water and you're probably not using enough salt. There are hundreds of shapes, um, actually 1,300 different pasta names. Well, some of those may be describing the same shape, but needless to say, the choices are daunting at the supermarket. So let's break it down into sort of four categories and then there's a bonus one. First off, I've got spaghetti here. It's long, it's thin, it needs a sauce that is pretty easily spread. Something thin, like a pesto 
or a fairly thin, loose tomato sauce because otherwise the sauce is going to clump on the noodles. Next up, we've got linguine. Now this is flatter and wider and so it can tolerate a thicker sauce, maybe something with cheese or a little bit of cream in it. Up here in the front, I've got tagliatelle. Now we've got nice wide ribbons, so chunks of meat, let's say in a ragu, or bits of carrot or celery in that ragu. The wider the noodle, basically the chunkier the sauce. Next up, rigatoni. And the most important thing here is these large tubes. It's perfect for trapping big pieces of eggplant or zucchini. Finally, I promise you a bonus item. This is my favorite shape. This is gemelli. And it's basically twin strands, kind of like a DNA helix, that are bound together. And why I like this is because it's double thickness, it's got double the chew. And if you like al dente pasta, this is definitely the pasta for you. I hope you will love your pasta as much as I do now that you know a little bit more about how to buy it and how to sauce it. Pesce al acqua pazza, or fish in crazy water, is a popular dinner along Italy's southern coast. Now, as the story goes, the crazy water is simply seawater that's flavored with a few aromatics. And I'm hoping today, Becky, that we're not going to use water from the Boston Harbor. I don't think that would be a good idea. <laughs> but this dish requires very little work, and we get a huge payoff. Oh, so, I love it. Really nice recipe. Okay. So we want to start with 12 ounces of haddock. Mm -hmm. Now, this recipe is often prepared with whole whiting, and that's an inexpensive fish, has nice, mild, sweet flesh. But since whole fish can be hard to find, that's why we're using the skin-on fillets here. OK, so we're leaving the skin on. We are skin Ooh, on. I like that. Now, if you can't find haddock, you could use branzino. Mm -hmm. You could use red snapper. Any firm white flesh fish will be really nice here. OK. So we're just going to season the fish up with a quarter teaspoon of salt. And the skin has so much collagen in it, it really gives a lot of body and flavor to the sauce. And an eighth of a teaspoon of pepper. Just get these nicely seasoned. All right, and now we will start our water-based sauce. Okay. So I have a tablespoon of extra virgin olive oil, and I'm gonna add a couple cloves of garlic, just sliced up. And then an eighth of a teaspoon of pepper flakes. I'm going to put that on medium heat. All right, so there's that sound we love. Mm -hmm. It's sizzling. All right, so now I have half of a medium onion diced up going in for just some nice subtle sweetness, a bay leaf, and I'm adding a quarter teaspoon of salt. We found a lot of recipes that add a lot of extras here, like you name it, capers, lemon, oregano, but we really found we really like a nice uncomplicated version. So the bay leaf will add a nice herbal background note and then the onion adds some nice sweet sweetness. Mm -hmm. A little bit of kick from the pepper flakes. That's right, just a tiny bit. So we're gonna let that cook for two to three minutes just until the onion starts to soften. Okay. Now here I have four ounces of grape tomatoes. You can also use cherry tomatoes. I love the grape tomatoes though because I feel they're a little bit sweeter and often I think the skins are a little bit thinner. And you know, we're using the small cherry or grape tomatoes here because they're good year round. Yeah. So they're always reliable. And they're gonna add really nice pops of sweetness and color to the dish. All right, so it's been about two minutes. You can see the onions are starting to soften here. Mm -hmm. it smells good. It smells good already, yep. So let's put those tomatoes in. And we'll let these go for another two to three minutes, just until the tomatoes start to soften a little bit. All right, so it's been about two minutes. You can see the tomatoes are softening up nicely. So let's add our water. I love how simple this is. So simple, so delicious. Very few ingredients all go in the pan, bringing out the most of every ingredient. That's right. So that was three quarters of a cup of water. Two tablespoons of dry white wine. We really like the nice little touch of acidity that that adds. And now we have six parsley stems. Mm -hmm. We're gonna eke out every last bit of flavor from the parsley here. And then I have one and a half tablespoons of parsley. I'm gonna add half and then we'll save half for later. All right, you can see that coming up to a boil. <laughs> Looks pretty. Very nice. And now we can add our fish. So we'll just nestle these guys in there. I told you, this was very little work. This I love was, this. Yeah. This is my kind of recipe. Yep, this is it. Now we'll just Put some of that goodness on top. The fish doesn't need to be completely covered here. Okay. This is just exactly how it should look. 
that is really just about all we have to do now. We just let it cook. We're going to put the lid on. Came up to a boil. I'm going to lower that so it gently simmers for three to seven minutes until the fish reaches 110 degrees. Okay, it's been about seven minutes. Let's take a look here. Ooh, ooh, that looks beautiful. Also, that's a really bare simmer. Just a few bubbles here and there. At home, I think I would've been tempted to crank up the heat a little bit, but that's what you want, nice and gentle. That's right, I turned the heat down to low. We wanted it nice and gentle. And now we want the fish to be at 110. So let's see where we're at. 111, I'll take it. Nice. All right. So it's not quite done. We need the fish to be at 135 to finish cooking, but what we're going to do is slide the pan off the heat and we're gonna let that finish off heat. And what that means is you can't screw it up. It's gonna be perfect. Oh, I love that idea. Letting something finish off the heat so it slowly comes up to temperature. Yep. Also keeps it nice and moist. That's right, you can't go wrong. All right, it's been five minutes and I think our fish is perfect. Look at that. It's about 135 degrees. It's cooked all the way through. It is pretty. All right, so I'm going to get rid of the parsley stems because they have done their job of giving us all their nice flavor. And we'll get rid of the bay leaf as well. I want to eat that. All right, can I give that to you? Sure thing. Thank you, ma'am. And now remember that extra parsley that mm -hmm. we had saved? I'm just going to sprinkle that on top. Oh, nice. I mean, that's gorgeous. It's beautiful. I can't believe how quickly that came together. Yeah, we made a really nice dinner for ourselves <laughs> yes, here. Yes, we did. Yes, you did. <laughs> I'm just going to give it a little taste, see if it needs any more salt and pepper. Mm. That is so good. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just going to tell you about it. I need a tiny bit of salt. <laughs> it really is. From just a water base, it's amazing it. what you can do. Yeah. Old school. Yes, that's it. All right, and I want to make sure I give you that gorgeous broth. Mm. Yeah, you definitely want to serve this in a shallow bowl because that broth looks delicious. Yeah, and now I have some nice bread for us here so we can get every last drop of that sauce. Oh yeah, it's her dunking in. All right, don't mind if I do? Oh, the fish is perfectly cooked. I mean, you can just flake it right off with a spoon. So mm. moist, so tender. So flavorful. Yeah, just perfect. Great for a newbie if, if you've never done fish before. Mm -hmm. Can't mess it up. That broth, mm. it has so much flavor. Mm -hmm. And that body, thanks to the collagen in the fish skin, really turned that water into a proper sauce. Mm. Oh, that's good. A little bit of heat in the back Ooh. end. You can taste the wine a little bit. Yep. You can taste the parsley and the bay leaf. Becky, this is amazing. Thank you. My pleasure. To make this simple but flavorful dish, build a braising liquid using sliced garlic and cherry tomatoes. Gently lay haddock fillets into the pan, cover and cook, then let the fish finish cooking off the heat. From America's Test Kitchen, a classic Italian recipe for pesce al acquapazza. You can find this recipe in all the recipes and product reviews from this season, along with selected episodes at our website, americastestkitchen.com slash TV. I'm definitely making this. Oh, yeah. Thanks for watching America's Test Kitchen. What'd you think? Well, leave a comment and let us know which recipes you're excited to make, or you can just say hello. You can find links to today's recipes and reviews in the video description. And don't forget to subscribe to our channel. See you later. I'll see you later.